Okay, this is Paul Gregg. Uh, the subject is Backyard Roller Coaster Engineering. It's August 28th, 2015. Some time ago, maybe a year ago, I started making spreadsheets that kept track of uh, two-dimensional uh, forces and stuff on a proposed roller coaster. I have three backyard roller coasters. And I thought I would document how what I did to uh, to see what the velocities were going to be for given heights and stuff like that. So if you don't know what a spreadsheet is, uh, you should. It's a very useful thing. Each one of these little squares is a cell and it can contain a value or an equation. Um, this is a pretty simple cell right here. Um, It, 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 it'll contain an equation, and uh, E3 means uh, column E, row 3. Um, you can learn about this elsewhere, but this is, you know, I have a bunch of equations, and I want to, uh, I want to plug a lot of numbers into them and uh, copy those equations and stuff so I can see what's going on. And so uh, spreadsheets are a very useful tool for lots of different people. And uh, you have to learn what that's about. So um, with the idea that I'm uh, trying to introduce uh, the physics and math to someone who might uh, be interested in how to design a backyard roller coaster, I'll tell you how I did it. I'm not telling you you should build a backyard roller coaster. I guess I can't be responsible for what happens with that. But this is what I did, and I tried to in, put some engineering into it. Uh, I'm a retired engineer, and I do this kind of for fun, and to uh, have fun with my grandkids. I have three backyard roller coasters, and I did this with each one of them to, to one extent or another so that I would know, you know how fast it was going and, and an idea of what the forces were when uh, the kids were riding it and uh, whether the cart would make it to the end of the track, things like that. And if you do that up front, that's what engineering is, is doing some, some thinking and some math ahead of time so that uh, the thing you build comes out smarter, I guess, the first time. Uh, so this is how this works. Uh, up here, this is, the, this is what I call it, um, BYRC, Backyard Roller Coaster Dash 2D. I call it a two-dimensional, even though it's three-dimensional. I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, dash 04, this is the what I call the little rocket. It's for littler kids that maybe um, weigh 30 pounds or something like that. Uh, and it's it's pretty small, the cart, so big kids can't even get in it. Um, there are things up here that I use in the equations, and I kind of put them up here separately. This is the drag coefficient. So uh, drag... Essentially, that's that's the air and friction resistance that the cart's going to see, and it's equal to the uh, the height or the the height loss that the track will travel uh, divided by the length that would uh, it would travel. Uh, for for example, a five percent ratio here would mean that uh, if you started out five meters high, you could travel 100 meters before it would stop. Now, obviously, as you go along this track, the friction is and the air resistance are going to be different as you go along it. The friction is going to be more when you're in a turn, probably, and the wheels are doing a little bit of side slipping. And the air resistance is going to be more when you're going faster in the front end. So, um, But I... To make it simpler, I just said uh, I'm going to take an average. And I did some testing on my first roller coaster and saw how far it went and came up with this idea that uh, I could just kind of average the the uh, energy loss due to friction and, and air resistance. And uh, that's worked okay for me. If it was going to be a real professional roller coaster, you'd do that in a lot more steps and, uh, and you'd uh, have a drag and you'd have an energy loss uh, much much more detailed than that. Uh, 
So this is the uh, this is a gravitational constant, 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, and I might as well talk about units. Uh, I went to college 40 years ago, and I learned the metric system pretty much. I was very happy with it. It's uh, very easy to use. The conversions are easy because everything just multiplies or divides by 10. You just move a decimal point, and you've got a different unit. And the definition of between, you know, the, uh, for instance, um, all the thermal calculations and uh, energy calculations, the definition of what a, a joule is is very simple. It's, it's uh, much easier than the English system. And even the English have abandoned the English system. They use the metric system now as well. Uh, Americans are pretty much the only ones in the, in the world still stuck with the English system. So I'm kind of, I'm, but I, but I worked at Boeing, which uses the English system uh, because they have a lot of big machinery that are in, that use inches, and uh, and I guess they don't, they, it's expensive for them to change, but it's, uh, it's painful now. It really ought to change. Hopefully somebody makes the, hopefully the United States changes the metric system, and we don't have to even think about uh, these. Uh, inches and feet units. But for now, uh, I'm working in both because uh, um, most people around the world are going to know what a meter is and a kilogram and, and that's going to be easy for them and people in the United States are going to want to know what that is in feet and inches. So we'll just work in both units for a while. The, the likelihood of making an error is higher when you're working in different units, but uh, I've lived with that for my entire life so we'll do that so to get going here um, so what we have here is different spots on this um, track you want to I started out with kind of deciding what this track was going to look like I designed it in a 3d CAD system but really you could do this on paper just as easily as long as you're going to make it simple and, and kind of stay in a two-dimensional world uh, you make an overhead view, and uh, all you need is a paper and a compass to do this, uh, and maybe a scale drawing ruler. Uh, you put the radiuses in there the way you think they're going to be, uh, and then you do a side view, uh, and that just is, so the way this goes, you can see the, the roller coaster starts here, I push the cart up here, I let it go, it goes through this first dip, it goes up this uh, second hill, and it goes into a bank turn down here, and gradually is still losing a little bit of altitude as you go. And it goes in here, goes over a little bump, and then goes through a couple curves and ends up back at the start. So point zero is where you start. Point one is where the real physics start. That's where the highest potential energy is. Uh, potential energy is like something that is not moving and kinetic energy is moving energy and so at point one there's no kinetic energy because it's not really moving you can't push it but for for uh, today's discussion it's just sitting there and uh, so that's all potential energy which is just uh, means it has some height that it's going to lose and uh, and then at point number two and point number four the cart's going pretty fast and so uh, a lot of the energy is converted into kinetic energy at that point. Point two, you're going fast, so that it has kinetic energy, which is which is uh, it's in motion. At point three, you lose some of that kinetic energy. You slow down a little bit, but you gain height, so you're gaining potential energy. So a lot of this, in the simplest terms, is just a trade-off between potential energy and kinetic energy. And if there wasn't any resistance. If this uh, roller coaster was in a vacuum and there wasn't any air resistance and somehow had perfect bearings and everything was perfect, uh, then this energy would just, we'd have, we'd have all that energy at the very end. Uh, it wouldn't slow down. And so energy is conserved. And so you, this energy would be either be kinetic or potential. And, uh, and if you started at point one, you could go around the track and it would actually end up at point one. But there is losses. There's energy loss. There's energy loss to friction and air resistance. So as it goes around, it uh, loses speed and loses energy. And so I've kind of made a calculation of that. So the, kinetic, the energy equations are here. It's uh, kinetic energy is, is uh, 
potential energy is the easy one. It's just uh, the mass times the gravitational constant times the height. So you take how much it weighs and times it by a gravitational constant and times it by the height and you know what the potential energy is. It's very simple. Kinetic energy is almost as simple. It's uh, kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the velocity squared. And so that's not too hard either. So basically as you go from location one to two to three to four, I'm just keeping track of the potential energy. And then as a, and then I'm saying if there was no drag, here's what the kinetic energy is at different points. And then I kind of do a drag calculation where I take this drag coefficient and times it by the distance that I've gone down the track. And I subtract that energy from the energy of the card at that time. And as you go down the track, that's just ever increasingly getting slower and slower. And so then I have kinetic energy with drag. And that unit is joules, which is a um, kilogram meter squared per second squared. I'll, we'll talk, I won't talk about the units too much, but the units are very important um, when you get into the details of this. And if you want to know about uh, work and energy, uh, there's lots of articles online about that. And it's very interesting stuff. All figured out about 200 years ago and uh, by some very interesting, very intelligent people. And uh, so kinetic energy with drag and then, so once I know that my kinetic energy with drag, I can calculate my velocity from this equation. Uh, and so if, if you look for the equation there, you can see that uh, here it is. So I've got, uh, I do a little bit of algebra and I solve for velocity here. And then I have this equation. Uh, 2 times K8. K8 would be the kinetic energy with drag. Divided by E3, which is up here. E3, that's the mass. And then the whole thing, take the square root. And if you do the algebra, it all works out that way. Um, and then, so then I know what the velocity is in meters per second. Here's uh, conversion to miles per hour. You can see this little this little guy is going to go nearly 10 miles an hour. It's fastest thing, which is really fun for little kids, two to eight years old. And then um, there's another equation here that tells me what the forces are when I'm going around a turn or through a dip or over a, a hill. And that's the this force, the centripetal force, is equal to the mass times the velocity squared divided by the radius of the turn. So if I'm going around a turn like this of a certain radius, and I know what the velocity is at a certain point, then I know what the side force is, when, given that I know what the mass is, which is I do. Um, so then I also, here, if I'm going through this dip at turn two, if I know what the radius of this dip is, then I can know what the added uh, force is in a downward motion. And I can add that to the 1g of gravity uh, and see how many g's I'm experiencing when I go through number 2. When I go over the hill at number 3, that those uh, centripetal forces are going in the opposite direction. They're kind of uh, going the opposite direction of gravity, and so they subtract from gravity. And if I, do, if I, if I run that correctly, I can even get some what they call airtime. I can have negative g's for a little bit of time here and be kind of being chucked out of the seat. But this one doesn't do that. I, I think I maintain positive g's through the whole thing. So the most basic, uh, and my first roller coaster, which I call the negative g, uh, just goes over, up, a, starts on top of a, my deck, and it goes down into a dip, goes over a hill where they do, where it does actually get a little bit of negative g's. And then it goes through another dip where it's going its fastest. And then there's a big run out that goes really high so that it can't go off the end. And then it runs backwards over the hump, middle hump up here. And then it runs forward over the middle hump. And that's the first one I did. It doesn't involve any turns. It's a lot easier to build. And, and, uh, and the cart is much, much simpler 
for a, a truly two-dimensional coaster where it just goes out and back and it doesn't make any turns. Once the coaster, once you Im implement the bank turns like this, uh, the coaster suspension has got to be a lot more complex. It's got to uh, allow for uh, roll, pitch, and yaw of the front bogey. There's just a whole bunch of things. So the place to start is just an out and back coaster with um, maybe four wheels, maybe eight, depending on how heavy you are. And and uh, anyway, uh, as you can see, as we go along here, we do the up down radius, and then we know what the G's are in the up up down direction, and then I add them with gravity. So the up down G's, including gravity, of course, when we start at uh, Point number one up here on the hill, it's just one G's. At number two, we almost go to two G's there uh, due to the, the centripetal force through that first turn calculated by this simple equation. Then when we get on top of uh, hill at the hill at number th point number three here, uh, we, don't, we go a little lighter than uh, one G. We feel a little light going over that hill, 0.75 G's. Then we go into into number four there we go at 1.7 g's and then going around the other curves at the end uh, the up down g's are just one and uh, the entire track here the way it turned out is not modeled at the end if i put more points in here and did did that i yeah, uh, it would turn out better but this is the kind of just for basics in front of getting in the ballpark this last one here is the turn radius now why do I put a 10,000 in there? I, I put 10,000 in there because that's a really big number. And basically that means that's straight right there. I did the same thing over here for the up-down radius in the in the 5, 6, and 7. It's really not going up and down at all, the radius. Uh, and so I put a large number in there. And that makes the math, you know, it's really infinity. A straight, a straight uh, line has a radius of infinity. But uh, equations don't like infinity in them. Uh, and so I just put a really large number there. So the turn radius here through my straight sections, through the uh, up-down section, the camelbacks or whatever you want to call them, I put in a really big number there. And, the, and then the optimum turn angle, which is, calcul which is calculated by this equation, this equation down here when it's, once it's reduced, and give credit to... Uh, Somebody organized this really well. They did a, pro, uh, a physics math problem where they had a car on a slope, you know, where like the Indianapolis 500, when the car goes around the, the corner there, it's, it's sloped. And what angle would, uh, would you need to have for a given velocity and a given mass uh, where you wouldn't have any side forces on that? And that's really the equation. You can look at this uh, website down here. Somebody, a uh, high school uh, professor, high school teacher, did a really good job of documenting that. So I copied all of the, that information from here instead of working it out myself. So I'll give credit to uh, Batesville High School, I think. Uh, but it's worked out a lot of other places, too. You can do a Google search on that and, uh, and figure out what the, the optimum is. So I have, this basically tells me the optimum angle where I'm not going to have any side forces as I go around a, a turn of a given radius and a given bank angle. So this tells me... When I'm in the straights, of course, I don't have any bank angle. But when I get out here to number 5, uh, 33 degrees is uh, the bank angle that, that I want to try to build to so I wouldn't have any side forces. It's okay to have some side force, but uh, if you want to get near 33 degrees, then it's uh, a little smoother and, uh, and the, the side forces, the side, are, are minimized. And then when it slows down a little bit out around number 6, the... The uh, angle is uh, around 20 degrees, and then uh, it gets lower than that. Uh, whether you want to follow that or not exactly, uh, at high speed, it's fun to have a bank turn and, and kind of experience more, more Gs and everything like that. But So that's the way that works. So as you, as you go through this, uh, that's what I did. I don't know if there's anything else to add to that. Basically, it's... Uh, it's what engineering is, is applying, you know, trying to predict uh, physical behavior uh, using math ahead of time.
and you usually end up with so you usually end up with something a lot better. Um, I did uh, I did put an accelerometer on the cart. Uh, just your tell it your your smartphone has accelerometers in it, and you can you can there's an app where you can record data. Uh, it's a little tricky because uh, accelerometers tend to get a lot of vibration and 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 data that's not real. It's too short a duration to really to really account for it. But if you filter that out a little bit, um, it, it did match fairly well the the forces that I was predicting. So I'm happy with this. And that's basically how I started uh, the design of my roller coasters.